I want to first of all um, welcome everybody who is uh, here and who is still joining us today uh, for our first just lunch of the spring semester. Um, I'm, we're very, uh, very honored to have uh, uh, our colleague in the history department and Judaic studies, Professor Stephen Norwood, uh, speak about his new book, Prologue to Annihilation. Uh, before I introduce uh, Steve, um, uh, I would like to just uh, again welcome everybody and um, uh, let everybody know that uh, we're uh, just about uh, chock full as, of events this semester. I think this is in the category of I don't know how much Zoom, how much more Zoom you can stand, but if you can. I think I can guarantee that every event this semester is going to be really uh, wonderful uh, for the Just Lunches, and that's um, in some ways our baseline uh, event at the Schusterman Center. Uh, we have Professor Misha Klein next month. Uh, she uh, is always a treat to listen to. Professor Jacob Howland from the University of Tulsa is coming in April, um, uh, one of the few people who I think should be allowed to speak about Hebraism and Hellenism because he actually knows what he's talking about, which so many in, who do talk about that subject don't, but he does. And then uh, we're um, reaching out um, to our uh, colleague in biology, uh, Tom Neeson, uh, to talk about water, bio water uh, conservation in Israel and its lessons for the American Southwest. Um, I, I'm sure like, like, like many of you, uh, I'm, I'm convinced that water is the oil of the 21st century. Uh, so we better know a lot about it more than we do. And, and Tom does. So I'm very happy he's going to be speaking. Uh, I won't even talk about all of our March events. I'll just say this February, um, uh, uh, I would like to remind you that it's our annual uh, Yadida Kalfin Stillman Memorial Lecture. Uh, this year, we're doing it a little differently. We're doing everything differently this year. We're trying to be a little innovative. And um, we are doing it in collaboration with World Literature Today. I see Professor Daniel Simon is, is on this call. And um, we're going to have two events. Professor Stevens is going to be speaking uh, midday with uh, Professor Robert uh, Cohn Davis Undiano uh, about Latinx literature. Uh, Professor Stevens is a native Spanish speaker, though he speaks many other languages as well. And they're gonna have a, a, an informal conversation that we're, we're all gonna be invited to. And then that night, Professor Stevens will deliver, I guess the 26th or 27th annual um, Yudita Kalfin Stillman Memorial Lecture. He's an exceptional speaker and an exceptional, exceptional, exceptional public intellectual. Uh, so we're very, very glad uh, that all of our events are going to happen. I thank the, uh, I thank those of you, the friends of the Schusterman Center, um, for giving me your feedback about um, Zoom versus live. I, I, I think uh, with the numbers uh, of um, coronavirus um, in this part of the world. Uh, this part of the country is still pretty high. Most, most of our usual audience was just not comfortable coming uh, back together face to face. Uh, and, um, you know, I think that we should respect that. And so we'll continue to do it all Zoom. I hope very shortly we'll be returning uh, to face to face plus Zoom. Uh, I know that I'm, uh, I feel, I know that we miss each other. Uh, 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 in the flesh. So uh, let me, uh, let me uh, uh, again, uh, thank you all for coming for the first of, um, gosh, I think it's about 10 events this semester for the Schusterman Center at large. And um, I want to very briefly uh, introduce uh, Professor Stephen Norwood. Uh, I say very briefly because he's so prolific uh, that if I were even to summarize his curriculum vita, it would uh, really cut into his time too much. And he, 
Steve's a guy who always has a lot to say, and I don't want to do that to him. Uh, Steve has published on uh, labor history in the United States, sports history in the United States, and in recent years especially, he's published on uh, the anti-Semitism and the Holocaust. Um, his uh, book, The Third Reich in the Ivory Tower, uh, 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 won a National Jewish Book Award in 2009. Uh, for those of you who've read that book, you'll know that uh, Third Reich in the Ivory Tower is just a scathing indictment of the complicity of higher education in validating uh, uh, the Nazi regime. I think it's a very important book uh, in the field. Uh, and uh, I must say Steve's most recent publication, which he'll be speaking about today, uh, Prologue to Annihilation, Ordinary American and British Jews Challenge the Third Reich, uh, I have to say, I think is a particularly um, fitting and a, a welcome bookend to his earlier book uh, uh, for Professor Norwood shows, I think conclusively, that there was indeed quite a lot of opposition expressed uh, to the Nazi regime uh, and, uh, and using a more uh, a bottom up rather than top down approach in this book, uh, 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 Professor Norwood shows this uh, to be true in a very, uh, a very uh, decisive way. And um, his uh, title, Ordinary American and British Jews, is also a rather clever uh, allusion to uh, a work of Christopher Browning, which uh, uh, those of you who are familiar with Holocaust scholarship are well uh, uh, aware of. So again, without further ado, uh, let me thank you all for being here. Um, and let me turn it over to my colleague, uh, Professor Stephen Norwood. Okay, thanks, Alan. Uh, just a second. Okay, uh, I'm going to focus on two major themes in uh, my uh, recent book. Uh, uh, first of all, far more was known in the United States and Britain about anti-Semitic atrocities and Nazi intentions than has uh, been acknowledged. And also there was uh, grassroots Jewish protest on a massive scale from the very beginning of Nazi rule uh, in contrast to the often feeble response of Jewish leaders. In April 1933, about two months after Hitler became chancellor of Germany, newspapers across the United States published a photograph smuggled out of Germany that showed grinning Nazi stormtroopers parading a Jew around the town of Chemnitz, Saxony in a garbage wagon. The photograph's caption stated that the stormtroopers had rounded up Chemnitz's Jews and forced them to scrub walls before jeering crowds. When one of them refused to comply with the stormtroopers offer, the stormtroopers placed him on exhibit in the garbage wagon and took him around through the streets to be jeered at by the inhabitants of the town. An American Jewish woman in the hamlet of Roundup, Montana, Seeing the photograph and accompanying report in the Billings, Montana Gazette, immediately wrote to Montana's US senators, John Erickson and Burton Wheeler, appealing to them to ask the American government to pressure Germany to, in her words, stop these unspeakable humiliations of Jews. The Manchester Garden and the London Jewish Chronicle, which were available on newsstands in New York, reported the same month that in Worms, Germany, the Nazis confined Jews in a pigsty. From the very beginning of Hitler's rule, Nazi annihilationist intentions toward Jews were implied by defining Jews as garbage in excrement, filth to be disposed of, and animals raised to be butchered. The press and radio exposed the Americans in even 
remote location, locations, the most remote, like Roundup, Montana, to such images from the, the time the Nazis assumed power. It was very obvious that this was a qualitatively different type of, uh, of regime and uh, Nazi intentions are being uh, very much made clear uh, this early on. Rabbi Max Abraham, imprisoned in the Oranienburg concentration camp in 1933, after his escape from Germany the next year, described in an account published in the United States how the SS guards in the camp impressed on Jewish inmates their worthlessness. On the first Jewish holiday after his arrival, the guards drove Rabbi Abraham and other Jews into a manure pit and ordered him to conduct his religious services there in the manure. When he refused, the guards beat him unconscious. The Oranienburg SS assigned the Jewish inmates the task of cleaning the camp's latrines, work especially reserved for the Jewish Sabbath. Rabbi Abraham had to dig into the feces with his bare hands as the SS denied him even a cloth. In July 1933, leading American and British newspapers, huge numbers of newspapers in both countries reported that Nazi stormtroopers in Nuremberg had seized 260 Jewish men, ranging in age from 17 to 76, and treated them like livestock. The stormtroopers herded the Jews through Nuremberg's main streets to a field outside the city. Elderly men, unable to keep pace, were prodded on by stormtroopers' kicks. Upon arrival, many of the Jews were made to get down on their hands and knees and uh, pull weeds out of the ground with their teeth. From the beginning of Hitler's rule, the Nazis singled Jews out for especially violent treatment. German Jewish novelist Leon Feuchtwanger who fled to Paris after Hitler's agents invaded his home and destroyed his manuscripts, declared to the New York Times in March 1933 that the Nazis had been carrying out, quote, pogroms such as Germany has not seen since the 14th century. He stated that the atrocities of the World War paled in comparison with the accounts of German Jewish refugees with whom he had spoken in Paris. This information is becoming immediately available to the West through this stream of refugees being able to, to make it out to cities like uh, Paris or Prague. The refugees had informed Feuchtwanger that, quote, every Jew in Germany must expect to be assaulted in the street or be dragged out of bed and arrested to have his goods and property destroyed, unquote. Jews were targeted for special abuse in the Nazi torture cellars. British Labor Party Member of Parliament, Alan Wilkinson, who traveled to Germany in 1933 to investigate Nazi persecution of Jews and political dissidents, reported that the Nazis' first attention to Jewish uh, prisoners was to smash their nose, to break their nose. Uh, a symbolic act because Jews were viewed as having unusually large noses. Wilkinson noted that the Nazis viewed the Jews as more evil than the communists. It was the Jews who had seduced uh, communists from their national allegiance. From the beginning of Nazi rule, the very beginning, many American Jewish and non-Jewish observers expressed fear that German Jewry would be exterminated. By March 1933, the Brooklyn Jewish Examiner considered the situation so desperate that it declared that, quote, only a miracle can save the German Jews from complete annihilation, unquote. March 1933. The same month, American journalist Dorothy Thompson, who had made several trips to Germany immediately before Hitler came to power and after Hitler came to power, warned that the Nazis were carrying out what she called a cold pogrom of economic strangulation designed to exterminate German Jews within a generation. Already the warning is out. Uh, the Jews are going to die out within a generation. They will be starved to death. Uh, employment is denied to them. Educational opportunities are uh, denied. And this is the intention of the Hitler regime. Uh, Jews are being forced out of the professions. Uh, so that deprives uh, and Jews are, uh, Jewish youth are being deprived 
of uh, opportunities for higher education. In many sections of the country, spontaneous boycotts of Jewish stores are taking place. Dorothy Thompson emphasized that, quote, every Jew in Germany, all 600,000 of them, is daily humiliated and threatened with the withdrawal of his entire means of existence, unquote. She declared that the cold pogrom, quote, aims at nothing short of German Jewry's destruction, unquote. Professor, Professor Richard Gottheil of Columbia University, one of the world's most eminent scholars of Semitic languages, in June 1933, similarly stressed in a newspaper interview that month that he, quote, was perfectly certain that Hitler and his band wished to exterminate the Jews of Germany, unquote. He predicted that unlike Spain, which had expelled the Jews in 1492, at that, at that time, the largest Jewish population in Europe, Germany would, quote, kill off the Jews by suppression of all means of livelihood, so that instead of a sudden death, they shall come to their end in a lingering torture, unquote. The same month, J Jacob Sonderling, one of Germany's most eminent rabbis, prior to his emigration to the United States, told an audience in Boston that the Nazi cold pogrom of economic strangulation, closing off educational opportunities and discriminatory laws was, quote, nothing short of German Jewry's complete destruction, unquote. You see how many voices are making this clear right away, covered uh, throughout the press. Uh, in November 1933, European journalist Pierre von Passen whose articles were syndicated in many American newspapers. Drawing on interviews he had recently conducted with Jewish, uh, with German Jews in uh, three widely separated cities in Germany, declared that international action was necessary to save German Jewry, quote, from physical extinction. Again, the phrase is used again and again and again. He endorsed the call that some American Jews had issued uh, including Rabbi Stephen Wise, to immediately settle 150,000 German Jews in Palestine. But he warned, von Passen warned, that unless such a plan was carried out at once, there won't be 150,000 Jews left to settle in Palestine. While savagely persecuting Germany's Jews, the Hitler government made Jewish emigration exceedingly difficult prohibiting Jews from taking more than a small amount of funds or property out of the country. This would ensure the liquidation of the Jew Jewish question in Germany for all time, they, in the language the Nazis were using. The Nazis were aware that few German Jews would be able to reestablish themselves abroad, even if they did manage to flee, because nearly all foreign countries were sealing their borders. Uh, as Alexander Brin, publisher and editor of Boston's Jewish Advocate, commented in 1933, German Jews were trapped like wild beasts. During the early months of history rule, Jews at the grassroots uh, are well aware of what's going on and take immediate spontaneous action. Uh, to be sure, the Jewish leadership is still dithering, but the, the Jews at the grassroots are uh, uh, very much determined to fight against this. And massive grassroots protests develop right away. Uh, of course, important sections of the Jewish leadership and the Roosevelt administration uh, make efforts to discourage this and attempt to contain uh, this spontaneous response. These demonstrations and rallies staged in streets, in municipal auditoriums, in synagogues and in schools, along with spontaneous boycotts of German goods and services are shaped by rank and file Jewish challenges to European pogroms. This had taken before on a massive scale uh, after World War I, for example, uh, and, and uh, back in uh, the 1890s to protest the conviction of uh, Captain Alfred Dreyfus. The Jewish masses, not the leading Jewish organizations, 
are repeatedly taking the initiative in pressing for forceful public protest against Nazi anti-Semitism, uh, pushing many of the Jewish leaders into a kind of panic. The American Jewish Committee, or AJC as I'll refer to it as, uh, representing more affluent and acculturated Jews, generally people of German Jewish origin, was deeply alarmed about Nazi intentions. That is definitely true. They were, the leaders were very concerned also about what was going on and had been meeting together since at least 1930 to try to figure out what to do. But they feared that aggressive public Jewish action against Hitlerism, like street march, marches and organized boycotts, and even public rallies with predominantly Jewish speakers would precipitate a dangerous anti-Semitic backlash in uh, uh, the United States uh, and further endanger Germany's Jews. The leading British Jew uh, Jewish organization, the Board of Deputies of British Jews, which is a, a very similar to the AJC, took the same uh, ultra cautious position and wanted to discourage, uh, uh, no, no one should be getting up and delivering speeches in Yiddish and Hyde Park against the Nazis. This is going to embarrass us and, and uh, isn't going to lead anywhere, it was their position. Uh, by contrast, the American Jewish Congress, which related more to Jews of Eastern European origin in this country, was more attentive to working class and lower middle class Jews uh, protests and uh, 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 is pushed into a, a reacting favorably to that protest and uh, uh, becomes convinced that it should help coordinate it. As early as 1932, before Hitler comes to power, many American Jews at the grassroots and some Jewish newspapers, uh, local Jewish newspapers, like the Jew Brooklyn Jewish Examiner, were pressing for an organized worldwide boycott of German goods and services should Hitler assume power. In other words, we have to get ready. It looks like this is going to happen. We have to be prepared for this. Uh, our, our, our people in Germany are in a, going to be in a desperate situation. Their lives are at stake. The AJC and the American Jewish Congress, however, both opposed an organized boycott. So does the Board of Deputies of British Jews. They're adamantly against an organized boycott. The AJ Congress is finally going to break with the AJC on this issue in August 1933, uh, uh, months and months after it's been in, put into play by Jew, working class and lower middle class Jews at the grassroots. Aware that Jews at the grassroots were inundating the White House and the US State Department with letters and telegrams demanding a strong American diplomatic protest against Nazi anti-Semitism, uh, the AJ Congress's National Executive Committee met on March 12, 1933. Remember, Hitler comes in January 30th. March 12th, they're already have been, have been pushed to meet to uh, plan a coordinated national day of protest across the United States. I've gone through thousands of these letters from the grassroots. It's extremely impressive what these people are forcing the leadership to do. The AJ Congress decided to make a mass meeting at New York's Madison Square Garden a central feature of the protest. Simultaneous street parades were scheduled for 11 major US cities for March 27, 1933, and many smaller communities around the country planned protest rallies. So it's a national outcry by the Jewish grassroots pushing the AJ Congress into action. AJ Congress President Bernard Deutsch informed the press that the National Executive Committee had deliberately scheduled its meeting on Purim in order to identify Adolf Hitler with Haman, the Persian official in the Hebrew Bible's Book of Esther, who had attempted to exterminate the Jews. On Purim 1933, rabbis across the United States dev devoted their sermons to uh, denouncing Adolf Hitler as the new Haman. On the evening of March 19th, 1933, the AJ Congress held a conference in New York City, attended by 1,500 representatives of Jewish organizations to build public support for a day of anti-Nazi protest across the United States. Deutsch credited the Jewish masses. He's open about it. We were pushed into this by the Jewish masses. They took the initiative in calling for a day of protest. 
The AJ Congress had issued the conference call, he said, quote, at the insistent and overwhelming demand of a practically unanimous jury, impatient to express its horror and indignation, unquote, at Nazi anti-Semitism. Earlier that day, the, the AJC's executive committee committed to quiet diplomacy and mistrustful of working and lower middle class Jews of East European origin, met hoping to persuade the AJ Congress to delay action. They make a very definite attempt to do that. Judge, and look at the kind of people these are. Judge Irving Lehman did not think the AJC could succeed. Uh, he was a top leader of the AJC because as he put it, quote, the AJ Congress regards itself as a mouthpiece of the inarticulate Jewish masses of the United States and is opposed on principle to holding them back from self-expression, unquote. A heaven forbid the Jewish masses should have self-expression. <laughs> James Rosenberg, another AJC top leader, suggested the AJC in any event issue a state signed by members of its executive committee and other prominent persons, quote, disavowing the intemperate expressions of the Jewish masses and expressing the sober hope that the German government would deal justly with all parts of the German population, unquote. That's their outlook. Sounds like the Roosevelt administration right there. Executive board members, uh, James Rosenberg and former uh, New York Supreme Court Justice uh, Joseph Proskauer decided to attend the AJ Congress. They actually come in an effort to prevail upon it to quote, hold off on demonstrations, unquote. Conference delegates that evening, however, were nearly unanimous in backing coordinated national street protests and rallies. The only opposition came from Proskauer and Rosenberg. George Fredman, national commander of the most militant Jewish organization, the Jewish War Veterans, of the United States, which is a very sizable group given the, the very large amount of Jewish enlistments that took place during World War I and the combat experience of many of these Jewish veterans. This is a, a major and very cohesive organization that plays a leading part in anti-Nazi protests from this point on. It has been largely ignored by scholars. It is the first group to propose an organized boycott of German goods and services which the AJ Congress leadership was not prepared to support and won't until August of 33. Now, American Jews had demonstrated their ability to mobilize in massive numbers before against the, the uh, anti-Semitic pogroms immediately after World War I, which may well have slaughtered a quarter of a million Jews uh, in Eastern Europe. There were massive street protests again coming up from the grassroots at that time, several hundred thousand Jews in New York City had taken part in, quote, gigantic spontaneous parades on the Lower East Side uh, the afternoon of May 21st, 1919. Uh, uh, most Jews uh, stopped work at noon to start the street demonstrations, quote, tens of thousands of Jewish children left their classrooms. Uh, Jewish men, women, and children carried banners in Yiddish and English parading up and down the streets of the East Side. These parades were often uh, led by recently demobilized Jewish war veterans. Uh, the New York Times called this, quote, big human protest, uh, uh, an act that had occurred without advance or program, just spontaneously developing from the grassroots. Pushcart peddlers abandoned their stands to take part. That evening, a massive crowd uh, converged at Madison Square Garden. Uh, five to 10 times the capacity of the garden, which is 25,000 capacity. Uh, and similar uh, uh, rallies and parades took place in uh, Boston, Chicago, Los Angeles, Washington, DC, and so on. So there was a precedent for this uh, massive grassroots action. I can go earlier too and, and talk about even earlier examples. Um, a few days after the March 19th, 1933 AJ Congress conference, the Jewish war veterans of the United States giving expression to growing grassroots Jewish militancy demanded that President Roosevelt, who will sit on his hands year after year after year, uh, will it, to issue a formal protest to the Hitler government against its anti-Semitic policies and sever 
diplomatic and commercial relations with Germany. It's the Jewish war veterans that first uh, is, is, is an organization calls for an organized boycott. The grassroots has been talking about this since 1932. Now we have an organization that's willing to carry this forward. Uh, it announces it will press President Roosevelt to appoint a Jew to be his ambassador to Germany to indicate American disgust for Nazi anti-Semitism. Of course, Roosevelt will do nothing of the sort, uh, never will. On uh, March 23rd, the Jewish war veterans uh, does a breakaway march from the AJ Congresses in New York four days before to publicize these demands. And here, for the first time, an organization is calling for an organized boycott of German goods and services. About 4,000 people participated in the march from St. Mark's Place on the Lower East Side to City Hall, including 700 Jewish war veterans members. Another 10,000 New Yorkers watched the parade from the sidewalks. The veterans marched in disciplined columns, really military fashion, comparing, uh, carrying the American and the Zionist flags. New York Mayor John O'Brien reviewed the parade at City Hall. Mayor O'Brien announced that he would speak at the March 27th Madison Square rally uh, against Nazism that the AJ Congress had agreed to uh, sponsor. After the parade ended, uh, Fredman and other Jewish war veterans leaders proceeded to the British consulate and presented an appeal to the British government to set a, a quote, a, aside uh, restrictions for uh, Jewish immigration in, in the Palestine. Basically, uh, 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 the, the call now is going up. It comes from the grassroots in uh, the US and in Britain both open the gates of Palestine to unrestricted Jewish immigration. This is the only way to save Jews. Uh, news of the Jewish war veterans parade was transmitted uh, as its uh, journal put it to the ends of the earth by press, by radio, by newsreels, informing a worldwide audience of significant American opposition to Nazi anti-Semitism less than two months after Hitler comes to power. The entire New York City press and many foreign newspapers carried reports of the parades, widely covered in the press. In muscular language, favored by grassroots Jewish protesters, the Jewish war veterans warned the Nazis that the march was, quote, only the opening gun, unquote, in its struggle against them, and emphasized that it had, quote, been a mighty salvo unquote. Okay. Uh, energized by what it built as its monster protest demonstration, the Jewish war veteran became the first organization in the United States to initiate an organized boycott of German goods and services. The day after the parade, the Jewish war veteran sent a thousand form letters to businesses throughout the country asking them to boycott all German goods. It condemned this quote, apathetic. This is the language they use against the Jewish establishment. It condemned them as apathetic, uh, called them the so-called leading Jewish organizations and denounced them for failing to support an organized boycott of German goods and services. The Jewish war veterans claimed that the American Jewish committee remain wedded to the medieval Jewish approach of cringing, begging, and praying, unquote, in their words. That's their characterization of the American Jewish Committee. The American Jewish Committee, the war veterans said, was, quote, too old and conservative, unquote. Now, obviously, the anti-Nazi boycott campaign launched in March 1933 is an organized campaign alarm the US state, Roosevelt State Department. They are really uh, deeply upset by this. Uh, a lot of these people had uh, looked on during the East European uh, slaughters of the Jews in 1919 to 21 and claimed that they weren't happy. Roosevelt has these people ensconced in uh, major State Department positions. And the State Department feared antagonizing the German government. 
a special agent of the State Department investigating the Jewish war veterans reported in June 1933, they had already written 100,000 letters to Jews throughout the United States, urging them to join the boycott movement and sending out 5 million boycott seals. You can look at envelopes from this period. There's the seal on it, pasted on boycott German goods. This was impressive because the Jewish war veterans, the State Department noted, had only a very small office in New York with only one secretary. From England, the Manchester Guardian, I mean, the, the greatest newspaper of the time, in my view, uh, reported that, uh, I, mean, I mean, the total opposite is true of the Guardian today, that may be the worst newspaper of all time. Uh, the Ma Manchester Guardian reported that public outrage over the Nazi dictatorship's oppressive policies continued to, quote, flame high in the United States. Thousands of telegrams were pouring into President Roosevelt and members of Congress demanding that the United States make an official protest to Germany against the Nazi persecution of Jews. On March 27th, the New York Evening Post, under the headline, Jews Show United Front, stated that the AJ Congress was receiving an avalanche of messages supporting the National Day of Protest across the country, from Jews across the country. Rabbis throughout the nation announced, quote, a day of fasting and prayer, unquote. In the Yeshuv, Jews determined to fast on March 27th in sympathy with German Jewry. And we'll see Jews across the world will now band together. Uh, Ashkenazi Jews, Sephardi Jews, Mizrahi Jews are all going to unite together uh, by this time, by this month of March in uh, spontaneous protests. Many distinguished uh, non-Jews uh, uh, did agree to speak at the Madison Square Garden rally on March 27th. They included uh, former Democratic presidential candidate in New York Governor Al Smith, uh, Senator Robert Wagner of New York, Mayor O'Brien, uh, American Federation of, Pre of Labor President William Green, uh, and there were a lot of Jewish speakers, including Rabbi Wise, uh, Bernard Deutsch, uh, Jewish Daily Forward editor Abraham Kahan, and uh, Morris Rothenberg, who was head of the Zionist Organization of America. So uh, Bishop John Dunn, who had been invited and who had initially agreed to participate in the rally uh, of the Catholic Archdiocese of New York, withdrew from the speaker's list the morning of the rally in deference to the wishes of the U.S. State Department, which had claimed, quote, the mistreatment of Jews in Germany has been stopped, unquote. And you get that from Roosevelt's Secretary of State, Cordell Hall, also. The National Day of Protest drew enormous support at the grassroots, with an estimated 1 million Jews participating in 300 protest rallies across the United States. Uh, Madison uh, Square Garden was packed to capacity, but 35,000 uh, were grouped in the surrounding streets listening to speeches on the loudspeakers. It was reported to be the largest protest meeting in American history, and broad, the proceedings were also broadcast over the radio. In Brooklyn's uh, heavily working class uh, districts, uh, Brownsville and Williamsburg, there's a spontaneous demonstrations that take place in the streets. People are in the streets for hours, and they're demanding an organized boycott. Uh, again, uh, in Chicago, Jews packed the auditorium to the top gallery, crowded the lobbies to hear speakers denounce the German government for its treatment of the Jews in, quote, notes of sorrow, bitterness, wailing, and the stern moral indignation of the ancient prophets, unquote. Thousands more heard speeches from the amplifiers outside. In Boston, Jews uh, at an AJ Congress sponsored mass anti-Nazi rally a few days later, April 3rd, at Faneuil Hall, the famous Cradle of Liberty, uh, uh, following uh, and held in defiance of Joseph Goebbels' threat to carry out the Nazis' nationwide boycott of Jewish stores and offices on April 1st. That had taken place. Uh, Jews were horrified by what they saw there. Um, uh, and uh, uh, Goebbels had uh, demanded that uh, uh, demonstrations in the United States stop or he would 
uh, carry out the boycott. More than 7,000 Jews uh, uh, filled the uh, Faneuil Hall to capacity and uh, uh, booed and jeered whenever Hitler's name was mentioned. Um, uh, thousands listened uh, to speeches on ampl through amplifiers out on the streets. Uh, the American Jewish Day of Protest, uh, March 27th, uh, had worldwide impact. Jews everywhere, from Mexico to the Middle East, from Mexico down to Buenos Aires, uh, publicly displayed their solidarity with it. On March 28th, the Jewish colony of Mexico City, numbering more than 2,000 people, staged a mass meeting to condemn Nazi anti-Semitism with uh, 2,000 people attending. 25,000 Jews attended a similar protest meeting in Buenos Aires on March 27th, 1933. In Tunis, in Tunisia, uh, a city whose population was one-fifth Jewish, Jews marched in the streets against the persecution of German Jewry. A French newspaper in Tunis reported on March 28th, quote, the bad treatment meted out to Jews in Germany under the swastika has raised very intense emotions in Tunisia and noted that for some time already, the merchants refused to buy or sell German merchandise. Tunis's grand rabbi had Jewish restaurants close on March 27th for the protest. Tunisian Jews outside of Tunis in smaller cities carried out anti-Nazi demonstrations. In Bissau, in Sousse, other smaller towns, it's taking place. In Britain, working class Jews in the heavily uh, working class uh, East End of London, as well as in Manchester and a number of other cities are uh, carrying out uh, spontaneous demonstrations against Nazism and uh, a well-organized boycott is set up by grassroots Jews as the board of deputies of British Jews refuses to endorse it. It's in full swing by the end of March, 1933. All over the East End, Jews had uh, written chalked inscriptions open the gates of Palestine, boycott German goods. Many Jews, however, expressed their deep disappointment in the quote, milk and water attitude, unquote, that some British Jewish leaders had adopted, quote, towards those who were trying to wipe out German Jewry. Working class Jews in London uh, were used very combative rhetoric to promote the boycott. Soon after the Nazis came to power, East End shopkeepers displayed notices in their windows all over the East End, announcing in both Yiddish and English, Judea declares war against Germany, boycott German goods. This is war. We're now in a war against Germany. Flyers announced that German goods are soaked in Jewish blood. In London's Whitechapel district, where the boycott was almost complete, quote, the pavement was chalked with open Palestine for German refugees and cars dashed about with boycott placards. Large crowds of Jews in the East End, working class Jews, prevented trucks from unloading German goods. Whenever a truck was sighted that was carrying German goods, it would be surrounded by a crowd, which in many cases within minutes had reached a thousand in number and were uh, uh, threatening to, to knock down the truck, knock it over. And uh, often the goods were taken out and smashed on the street and there were threats to burn the trucks. The militancy is that intense. The American and British anti-Nazi protests, of course, uh, caused deep alarm in the Hitler government and Hermann Goering announced that, that, that uh, there was no persecution of the Jews in Germany. The Jews who were persecuted were just criminals and communists. Uh, I don't know, I'm gonna have to uh, wind this up so I'll skip over uh, some of this. I do wanna, uh, I'll, I'll finish up so that I know people wanna participate and have questions uh, at this point. Uh, uh, very shortly after this, uh, May 10th, 1933, only six weeks later, a second wave of mass protests takes place in the United States. Uh, and there will be another one in July in, in uh, London. Uh, in New York, 65,000 Jews march for six hours. This is in protest against the Nazi book burnings, uh, onlookers, and Nazi anti-Semitism generally. 
Onlookers stood seven deep along sidewalks of Fifth Avenue and Lower Broadway. Uh, showers of ticker tape floated down from office towers in the financial district. Spectators looked on in awe, according to newspapers, at uh, as a contingent of 2,000 rabbis marched by, quote, making a majestic picture with their long flowing coats, beards, and faces that glistened with sorrow on the occasion, unquote. The demonstrators, demonstrators included uh, uh, Talmud Torah students, sweatshop workers, judges who deserted their benches to march against Hitler, uh, a, a whole cross-section of the Jewish population, Jewish college students chanted 2468, who do we want to assassinate Hitler? A massive labor contingent participated, including uh, a union that uh, carried my uh, a favorite sign of all in the protest, the Undertaker's Union, whose sign read, we want Hitler. 50,000 more marched in Chicago, 20,000 in Philadelphia, 10,000 attended a mass rally in Cleveland. It's going on all over. Uh, just to conclude, uh, the mass grassroots protests uh, get extensive press coverage, front page, multi-column around the world. Uh, they have a significant long-term impact uh, in the population, awaking millions of Americans and others around the globe to the danger of Nazism. Of course, anti-Semitism is at its peak level of anticity and coming to its peak level of uh, intensity in the United States in this very period and will reach its all-time peak uh, in World War II. Of course, coming back full force now, today. Uh, American youth who witnessed or read I grew up among Jewish World War II veterans, including my father, who was in combat for 195 consecutive days, frontline against the Nazi army. I know from them the impact these uh, demonstrations had as they were 10 or 12 years old, watching this go on, and then would rush to enlist in the armed forces to fight the Nazis. Uh, these soldiers' memories of masses of Jews marching in the streets against Hitler during the spring of 1933 denouncing the Nazis' anti-Semitic atrocities and demanding immediate militant US action against Germany caused them to put their maximum effort into fighting the Wehrmacht when, Wehrmacht when they went into combat. They understood what was at stake. Unfortunately, the Roosevelt administration dithered and uh, really is not addressing this issue openly. Uh, the State Department is a real obstacle uh, in the path of people uh, uh, moving against uh, Nazi Germany in a forceful way. And when, it, when there is movement, it, 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 it will uh, be much too late. Uh, this uh, uh, history could have turned out somewhat differently. Uh, this was the period when something could have been done. There are very talented correspondents for the Manchester Guardian, like Robert Dell and Frederick Boyd, whom I talk about in the book, who are calling in 1933 for a preemptive uh, military strike against Germany for Britain and France to go into Germany, hit it hard, or else watch out what's going to happen. 